We insist here at First Unitarian Society that our congregation be, quote, a safe place to share dangerous ideas. Now, as with all high-flown aspirations, El Diablo is in the details. What we must be sure we are doing here is not mere virtue signaling, which is easy, saying one thing and doing something else, or hitting like on Facebook, retweeting, and that sort of thing. We must be sure we are not merely signaling virtue, but walking the walk. I was grappling with today's topic because my talk today was auctioned at our service auction. And while I was gathering my thoughts, an incident occurred at the Unitarian Universalist Association General Assembly, exactly illustrating the issues I was considering. A minister was asked to leave General Assembly after publishing and distributing a book considered hurtful to GLBTQ people and people of color. That violates the very essence of free speech, doesn't it? Or does it? Now, Rev. Kelly will be considering that incident on July 21st, and you might hear a little bit about it today at noon from Rev. Kelly and Rev. Jim with their GA report. Another incident underlining this topic occurred the other night as the Democratic debate between Joe Biden and, and Kamala Harris went on. And when it comes to wrongs in the U.S. and U.S. history, who speaks with authority and who needs to be doing the listening? And the answers are not as simple as they might at first appear. For now, I hope to consider the broader issue of free speech, forbidden speech, and orthodoxy in religiously and politically liberal spaces. Because, let's admit it, Anyone can spew hate anytime. We have that right. Uh, we do have freedom of speech. So that's not the question. The question is responsible free speech. Now, I open this can of worms. Aware of my social location, I'm an old white guy. I'm cisgender, I'm heterosexual, and I'm an old academic to boot. I have three terminal degrees. How dead does that make you? Three terminal degrees. And I spent nearly 40 years in the privileged environment of the universities. And I'm a leader in one of the premier humanist organizations around. So yeah, I've got some privilege. And I've been talking and people have been sort of listening for a very long time. Now, this is a difficult topic, a fraught topic. It may even be a topic where angels fear to tread. But I have never claimed to be an angel, and so... I rush in. I've talked before about the theological foundation of the very idea of democracy. That's why I shared that one of our seven principles today about democracy. This isn't as abstract and academic as it may at first appear, and I want to try to think through that. The saying goes and went, vox populi, vox dei, the voice of the people is the voice of God. Now, I want to unpack that a little bit. As we know, the European monarchies had justified their power by claiming that God, the Christian God, chose them, the monarchs, to rule over the people. Now, one of the outcomes of that was the invasion of Africa and the Western Hemisphere. In the 1600s, Puritan British people disputed that claim, and successfully lopped off their king's head and proceeded to set up their own government. Now, how to justify letting the people choose their ruler instead of God? It was a problem. Solution, you make the same claim that the monarchs had, but in a slightly different way. Vox Populi, Vox Dei. The voice of the people is the voice of God, and therefore, we're justified. At first blush, this sounds nice, doesn't it? But again, this is not abstract stuff. Some of you heard the Reverend Jim Bear Jacobs 
a member of the Stockbridge Munsee Mohican Nation, give a little talk here about three weeks ago. We just took down an art exhibit out in the gallery that included photos of a sculpture in the Minnesota State Capitol building that he talked about. What it says is, Vox Populorum Est Vox Dei, which is a more pedantic way of saying Vox Populi Vox Dei. In the case of Minnesota, this was a claim that Europeans could justifiably kill natives and steal their land. And you can look up that piece of sculpture and, and mural online if you'd like to. The Reverend Jim Baer pointed out that the Capitol paintings are full of angels floating everywhere, symbols saying that the Christian God approves this message and condoned what the Europeans were doing here in Minnesota. One of the figures in the Capitol paintings is a hunched half-animal figure. It's uh, labeled ignorance. Now, that's a racist character of a person of color, ignorance personified, if you will, being driven out of the state by a blonde white guy. The Minnesota State Capitol building enshrines and perpetrates and perpetuates this genocidal racist lie and this illegitimate claim to power, Vox Populi, Vox Dei. The invading Euro-Americans were loading the dice because, if we think about it a bit, lots depends upon which people get a voice and whose God you're talking about. Now, please hear what I'm trying to say. I'm not saying that liberal democracies are a bad idea. What I am saying is that we need to keep in mind who is doing most of the talking and what that motivation might be. Think about this voice of the people as the voice of God thing a little bit. Take the UK Brexit vote as an example. Before the vote, polls showed that only 37% of eligible voters supported Brexit. 37%. But 57% of the voters who showed up at the polls supported Brexit. Now, I think it's fairly clear that behind the claim about democracy being the voice of God is an idea or a claim that the majority of the people want something. So, what happened in the Brexit case? That's one example. Take an example from here in the good old USA. How exactly is it that God is speaking through the people when a majority of Americans vote for a particular presidential candidate, but the other candidate wins the electoral college count? Is it those who show up at the polls or those who vote in the electoral college who get to represent the voice of God? Or is it, as this old humanist suspects, that there aren't any gods involved. It's all a human construct. A human construct that very well might not be working as advertised. Yet, one of the rules of liberal club is that we believe in democracy. It says so in those seven UU principles. Not so clear is how said democracy is supposed to work. Who's voice. As I've mentioned before, Benjamin Franklin himself described democracy as, quote, two foxes and a chicken voting on what's for supper, end quote. Franklin's answer was to build a republic so that the chicken, if you will, the minority voice, got a chance. But isn't the fact that here in the U.S. men, mostly white men, vote on what women can do with their bodies, Hmm, isn't that about the same as the principle that Franklin was talking about, two foxes and a chicken voting on what's for supper? Is this working as advertised? You can see, I hope, why the Reverend Jim Bear Jacobs is a little bit skeptical of that claim that the voice of the people is the voice of God. His people and his God didn't get a voice. Here's the truth. I think it's not about God. It's about naked, brutal power. And you see, 
I hope why people of color often have some trouble accepting the contention that the majority here in the U.S. is speaking for God. And you can see why marginalized groups are skeptical about putting their rights and futures in the hands of governments like that. Governments claiming to speak with the voice of God upon, oh, I guess we'll have to call this flimsy evidence. Let's take another given. And here's another sacred cow for you. That debate is the way to get to democratic answers. Free speech as a concept is all about what Adam Smith called the marketplace of ideas. The marketplace of ideas. The claim is that when all the ideas get shared and aired publicly, the good ones sell and the bad ones get canceled. Sort of like network television shows. But how often are the purveyors of ideas actually honest brokers? And how often is debate actually debate rather than mere loud proclaiming by the loudest people in the room? Is debate the way to truth? Now, the English word debate comes to us from Old French. Debetre, debetre, to fight to contend or to beat down. Yes, the word debate literally contains the root of the word batter, to beat down. Now, is that the way we want to be doing democracy? How about, oh, conversation instead? Because here's the thing, when we aren't in conversation, too often we forget the humanity of the other. And off we go battering. The term conversation is based on two Latin words, verto, which means verse, which means to turn, verto, and con, which means with, chili con carne. <laughs> so to turn with. You can't converse to someone, right? You can only converse with someone. The turning is a turning which implies going in the same direction rather than opposite directions, if you get the point. Now here's something to think about that I think is true. It's harder to marginalize, hate, and kill people you have conversed with, people that you have turned with. And as I've said many times, humanism needs to work at reversing many of the old bad habits of Western thinking, if we can reverse those by forgetting some of the rules and reimagining. One bad idea is that some god or other wants the same things that we want. And another is our failure to communicate, to converse. All we have to do is look around. What we see is a whole lot of mansplaining white-splaining, and hetero-splaining going on. And that's what that kind of splaining will do. The evidence says that our society is not about turning with, it's about battering down. It's about othering rather than ussing, if you will. Our summer intern, Jay Hooper, has some thoughts about this. Jay? So, yeah. Thank you, David. I think one of the things that we need to first sit with is just how that just happened. I enjoy telling people what I do all the time. And like David, I'm in the academy, but I can't say it's a privilege. I grew up in parts of Richmond, Virginia that were predominantly white. My neighborhood was predominantly white, middle class. My parents worked three jobs to make sure that I went to a good school, to make sure I learned exceptionally well. If that's privilege, then so be it. I would like to say that, yeah, I'm like David, I have terminal degrees and so on and so forth. I'm two in, right? <sighs> If that's privilege, I can tell you how many times I've been in spaces and been invisible. 
My story is not heard in the same way as some. Some would assume because I can be in those spaces that we're doing the job, we're doing the work. I gave him a scholarship, he showed up. And it comes with an extra amount of mental and physical scrutiny. I like to very be, be very clear about my position. I, I'm a huge fan of Bayard Rustin. And so I love Rustinian scholarship. And so I am the angelic troublemaker. I like to come in and I like to be very clear that I love reading James Baldwin. So I'm a little bit of a Baldwinian scholar and I am in love with critiquing the very thing that I love as he talked about America. And for those who deeply believe in the work of justice even further, though some would lean deeply in, sp in liberal spaces around Dr. Martin Luther King, I lean on Malcolm X. Because legislation doesn't guarantee my freedom. And though I appreciate the work that we do in these spaces and predominantly white spaces to predominantly white liberal spaces, and we work for progression, work for progression, there's a real deep understanding that I myself will always be a black American in search of freedom and knowing myself in spaces that are predominantly white. I enjoy coming up right after David because what it allows for you to do is have a different listening ear. I don't have to say anything. You probably already adjusted your ears. You put on, you took off your, hopefully some of you took off your, your uh, colorblindness glasses and saw, okay, he has a different experience and a different story. And I don't see him like David, but I see him as a part and contributing to the brilliance in the room. I think that it is important to analyze that because when we as a congregation, as I was listening to David talked about congregation, that we, we have the ability in this space to, to do what, David? What was that word you said? It was a phrase that you, in the very beginning about, uh, that we can say, that, that this congregation in, in many ways has like a sense of courageous space. We can do that, right? Safe place to save dangerous ideas. You know, I sat in a North Carolina, uh, that's what I wanted to hear. I sat in a, sat in a, sat in a event in North Carolina and uh, a young lady by the name of Mickey Jones, she's an activist and she, she said, safe space is BS. I said, all the liberalism went out the door. I can tell you how many people took cover and we're like, oh, what's going on? What do you mean it doesn't exist? What do you mean it's BS? What do you mean? And it was funny because she called it out as it needed to be said because she said no. She said safe space is BS. The only thing that can really exist if we really want to do this work, if we want to really have courageous work, if we really want to be out beyond this wall, right? is that we have to have brave space. Brave space is the conversation. Brave space is being able to look at the very thing that is unique from you, not different, unique. Set up in a particular way that allows for you to begin to challenge and add to your brilliance. Because none of you are dumb in here. Let's just be real, that's what my grandmama would say. She'd look at you and none of you are dumb in here, you know what to do, right? And so in the end, we just gonna add to the brilliance in the room. And so my, my side of this is that at this point, we need to move into brave space. We need to begin to embody. See, we can talk about academy as a privilege. We can talk about being in humanist spaces as a privilege to be able to engage intellectually, soundly, social justice-wise. To study justice as a privilege was something I, is something I used to say, particularly as a person of color, for me to know what was my right and know it well was a privilege. Not everyone 
in my community would know that immediately. But I do say this as we do this work, we have to begin to embody what we're reading. And that's hard. Some of you have read wonderful scholars. I have listened, I have heard. But the text affects me very differently than how it affects you. When someone writes about black experience, it's my lived experience. When someone, it amazes me. I love the Academy for this very reason. It is in love with its own myth. The Academy is in love with its own myth. Pardon me for those who have doctoral degrees and masters. I promise you, I will respect you. But in the end, we are deeply in love with our own myth. We give somebody a degree. As soon as they say that we're dealing with women, gender, and sexuality, and they get that degree, they feel like they're an expert. And so I can tell you how to handle a woman's body. I can tell you what to do with themselves. I can t if we decide to do geniatrics and all those other things, we, we can tell you how to handle your seasoned life. We can tell you but nobody knows your experience but you. No one knows what it means to be whole for yourself but you. And if we are not having these radical conversations, if we're not having these brave conversations, if we're not sitting together in complete community, we will always be strangers and never beloved strangers. So how do we find the beloved stranger? We have to get brave. We have to start hearing, not only with our ears, not only with our deep intellect, but learn how to develop real relationship. I admire the liberal and I admire the progressive liberal for the work that they're doing as it relates to contributions, intellect. But sometimes the hand is so weak, though the mind has everything. The mind is more soiled than the hand. And some of us need to get our hands dirty. Some of us need to just, you can, I love y'all, but some of us need to keep our pockets just where they are and let's get the hands going. Let's get the feet going. And it's not just protest, it's how you doing? It's sometimes just checking on the neighbor that you ain't seen in some time, asking that security guard that has always been in your building that knows every door and every access, ask them how they're doing sometime. Build relationship so that we can get to community. So, you know, in response, I think we've gotta to get to a place where we have to ask ourselves, what are we doing and what's going on with us that we still stay in these places that we can only receive justice through an intellectual lens and not, a, and not an actual pro, programmatic lens, right? Doing, the doing, the hands, the practical, right? Many of us understand philosophy in here. Let's get some practical philosophy. So I'm really excited, you know, to, to add that to your brilliance. I'm not gonna hold you long because I know we are gonna move forward with, uh, with the order of this, but I want to leave you with this one thing, too, as well. As the concept was brought up about truth, ancient Sanskrit refers to truth in a very interesting way. It breaks down this word all the way to something that has an accent of an A, and it looks like an R. They're side by side, and when you say the word, it's earth. When you look that word up, it's supposed to be truth. It also derives from the word art. I am asking you to be not only brave, but be creative. We have to begin to reimagine what this community can look like. I can honestly say it is very hard to be in, be in these spaces, but for me, I enjoy coloring white spaces. <laughs> I do, I do, and I, and I appreciate you allowing for me to be in your Crayola box. <laughs> because that's how the work gets done. You can't have 96 uh, colors that all look the same. <laughs> so I hope to be a body of uniqueness that we can share in actually doing this work. 
So I love y'all. Do the work. See how lucky I, you, you all pay me to, to talk with him every day. So how about, how, how cool is that, right? Uh, to, to conclude, uh, in your order of service this morning is a quote by literary critic Terry Eagleton. Quote, the din of conversation is as much meaning as we shall ever have. End quote. I like that. At first glance, it might look like a kind of bleak assessment of what humanity can know. But you see, conversation, turning with other people, leads to seeing new ways of reality. And our theme for this summer is justice embodied. Hmm. Jay came up with that. Thank you. Justice embodied implies two things, for me anyway. One's getting out of your head and into your body. And two is getting out of your comfort zone and into the hubbub of conversation. My hope today has been to trace how the very concept of free speech is soaked in Euro-white patriarchal assumption. I'm not saying that free speech isn't a great thing. I'm saying that the concept, when we look at it a little bit, can be rife with white supremacy and misogyny splaining. Yes, even the sacred cattle known as reason, logic, and science can fall prey to these obfuscating evils. I want to leave you with a couple of anecdotes. I've long, long been fascinated by an incident that appears to have actually happened. In 1930, at the second conference on the epistemology of the exact sciences, which was a conference predicated on the idea of complete objectivity in human knowledge and truth, all right, a 25-year-old named Kurt Gordel, who had just completed his doctoral studies, got up and shared his incompleteness theorems, he was calling them. Those theorems, which were pure mathematics, undermined the entire project of the conference, the epistemology of the exact sciences. Young Herr Gordel demonstrated that math has a great big hole in the center of its central claims. Apparently, many of the great assembled mathematicians immediately saw that Kurt Gordel's math was correct, and they had been wrong for years. And right there in the room, they said, your math is right, we've been wrong. Now, that's how human thought ought to work. Unfortunately, anecdotes like that are kind of rare. The physicist Ma Max Planck stated the more usual mode of scientific thought. Quote, a new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually die. <laughs> and the new generation grows up that is familiar with it. Now that saying is popularly uh, quoted, you'll see it around as, quote, science advances one funeral at a time, end quote. Science advances one funeral at a time. So much for debate. Democracy, debate, reason, logic, science, these are not as solid as cornerstones and foundations as we often hope they are. Let's resist making it true that democracy advances one funeral at a time. When white supremacy and patriarchy and motivated reasoning and on and on and on are running in the background as background programs in our minds, the output is not as pure and sound as we wish it would be. But that's a hopeful, hopeful not a frightening prospect, I think. We are not called to be God's pontificators. We are called to be people of nuance. And the way to get to nuance is not debate, but conversation.